20 to 30% of all births are cesarean sections or C-sections, and that figure is continuing to rise. And there are multiple reasons as to why a C-section needs to be done. Sometimes they are done as an emergency procedure, and more often they are planned and scheduled for various other reasons. So since they are relatively common, we're going to go over what actually happens during this procedure by showing you the tissues that you have to cut through layer by layer, what happens to the muscles, the uterus, and even the organs that are in the abdominal pelvic cavity. It's going to be a surgical one. So let's jump into this anatomical awesomeness. So we are going to look at two different incredible donor bodies today in order to give you two different perspectives on C-sections. One is this sagittal view, and the other is going to be from this anterior view or what is closer to what a surgeon would be seeing. But I do want to quickly mention that there isn't a specific or universal procedure for all C-sections. The type of procedure that's performed depends on a variety of factors, including the doctor and the circumstances, such as, is it an emergency C-section? If it is to save mom and baby's life, that might lead to a vertical incision for quicker access, as compared to if it's a planned C-section, where this will allow for a more methodical approach, where the more typical low transverse incision, often referred to as the bikini line cut, is used. Plus, factors like if mom has already had multiple C-sections, or even body habitus can also play a role. So keep in mind, there are multiple factors that dictate the exact type of incision that's going to be made. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of commonalities that modern techniques share, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's just quickly reference some landmarks on Jeffrey the skeleton to help us identify where the most common incisions are going to be made. Most of the time, they'll go anywhere from two to five centimeters above this area here called the pubic symphysis, which avoids the bladder and other pelvic structures. And you can see this piece of cartilage here, and this piece of cartilage connects these two pubic bones which again, this connection is called the pubic symphysis. So they go just a few centimeters up and they'll utilize another bony landmark that you can see here called the anterior superior iliac spine or the ASIS. So they're going to go a couple of centimeters in medially from one ASIS and make their transverse incision and then stop another couple centimeters before they reach the other ASIS. But again, it does depend on those factors I mentioned earlier for the exact height at which they make this initial transverse cut. But what's interesting about this initial cut or incision is that it is not meant to go all the way down to the uterus because they actually want to avoid making a transverse cut through the six pack muscle called the rectus abdominis. So first, they're only cutting through the superficial layers of the abdomen. And let me show you what this would look like on this cadaver dissection. This is an anterior or front view of the abdominal wall. Here's the belly button for a frame of reference. And the belly button still has some surrounding tissue that can show us what they would cut through. So this first incision would go through the epidermis and dermis, which you can see here, and even through the hypodermis that you can see here. And the hypodermis is also referred to as the subcutaneous layer and is made of adipose or fatty tissue which means it can be quite variable in thickness. With this one, you can see it's not terribly thick, but on this other body, you can see it's much thicker. But after getting through the hypodermis, the surgeon will do some blunt dissection instead of just using the scalpel blade. And they do this because again, they don't wanna cut into the muscle underneath because this increases recovery time and can also increase the risk of complications. If you use a sharp tool, such as a scalpel for everything you're doing, you've increased the likelihood of severing blood vessels and just making it more difficult for that tissue to heal. So they're going to use their hands and the blunt ends of instruments to carefully reveal the deeper tissues, which we're going to take a closer look at now. So you probably noticed that there was a difference between the right side of this abdominal dissection versus the left side. On the right side, we've only revealed two blocks of the rectus abdominis muscle. Most people will have four blocks on each side for a total of eight, which is kind of funny because we typically refer to it as the six pack muscle. However, most people actually have eight. But on the left side, you can see there's this white connective tissue sheath that is completely covering up the rectus abdominis. And this is called the rectus sheath. And this is directly underneath the hypodermis. But what forms this rectus sheath? Well, the rectus sheath is actually a fusion of the tendons from the muscles of the lateral body wall. And you've likely heard of the obliques. So here you can actually see the external oblique, the internal oblique underneath, and the third muscle called the transversus abdominis. Now, most of the time when we think of a tendon, we think of these rope-like tendons like the Achilles tendon. 
but these cylindrical rope-like tendons are often extending from these round bulbous muscles like the gastrocnemius. And most tendons, with a few exceptions, attach the muscle belly to a bone. But the obliques and the transversus are these large sheet-like muscles. So they're not going to have this rope-like tendon. Instead, they're going to have these sheet-like tendons. And the name for a sheet-like tendon is an aponeurosis. And so at least below the belly button, the aponeurosis from the external oblique, which you can see right here, the aponeurosis from the internal oblique that you can see here, and the aponeurosis from the transversus abdominis, which is a little harder to see, but you can see a piece of it right there. But all of these aponeuroses from all three of these muscles will run in front of the rectus abdominis, fuse together, and this creates this white sheath that we've learned is called the rectus sheath. But what is also important to our C-section story is that these obliques in the transversus muscles are on both sides. And so the rectus sheath on the right and the rectus sheath on the left will actually attach to and bind together in the midline, creating a vertical line that you've likely seen on people with defined abs called the linea alba, which translates to white line. And you can actually see it here on this cadaver dissection. And the reason we care about the linea alba with C-sections is because this is what the surgeons are trying to get down to after doing that more delicate blunt dissection. Because instead of making a transverse cut through the actual muscle, they will make a vertical cut through the linea alba in order to expose what's inside the abdominal cavity. And so essentially, we've made a more aesthetically pleasing procedure. Creating a vertical incision through the skin is a bit more noticeable than a lower horizontal line that could be covered up by swimsuit bottoms, hence the nickname the bikini cup. Plus, only taking that horizontal line down to the rectus sheath and changing to a vertical line on the linea alba spares the muscle from excessive damage. But what will we see once we get through the linea alba? I'm assuming that most of you watching this video are interested in your health. And so let me quickly talk about an awesome tool that can give you many incredible health insights, and that is the Hume Health Body Pod. The Hume Health Body Pod is a clinical grade body analyzer and is much more than just a bathroom scale, as it gives you a lot more information than just your weight. The Body Pod uses bioelectrical impedance analysis to scan and deliver over 45 metrics, things like skeletal muscle mass, body fat percentage, hydration levels, and metabolic age, to name a few. And one of my favorite features is that it breaks that data down into regions so that you can see how much fat and muscle you're carrying in your limbs versus your trunk, and even compare right and left sides so that you could target any muscular imbalances during your workouts. Now the body pod claims to be 98% accurate. And when I first started using the body pod, I was able to put that accuracy to the test because I actually had body composition tests done in a lab around the same time, and the results were nearly the same. So I've been using it for months now, and I've been logging consistent weigh-ins, syncing my sleep and workouts, and even setting milestone goals that I can track in the app. And as a bonus, the body pod is HSA and FSA eligible. So if you're excited about setting some New Year health goals, click the link in the description to check out the body pod, as they are currently having a New Year sale for 35% off. And if you also use our discount code, the Anatomy Lab, it can help save up to 50%. So go ahead and start optimizing your health routine today. And now, let's get back to C-sections. Well, let's finally take a look at this other cadaver dissection. And just to orient you, we're going to be zoomed into the lower abdomen, so right about here. So as you can see, the rectus sheath is completely intact on this cadaver. And we've also made an incision that goes around the lower aspect of the abdomen. And I want to be very clear here, that is not what they do during the C-section. That's just something we did in order to be able to see the underlying anatomy. But remember, there's this white line here called the linea alba. So if we had removed that rectus sheath, you'd be able to see that linea alba much more clearly. And what they do is they make an incision, going vertically through that linea alba, and then separating the two rectus abdominis muscle heads. And after they separate the rectus, they'll run into this thin serous membrane called the peritoneum, which they would also need to go through. But as I pull this back, we can see a giant piece of tissue that you really wouldn't have to worry much about during a normal C-section, and this is called the greater omentum. This is a fatty, apron-like tissue that drapes over the intestines. But you have to remember, in a full-term pregnancy, this thing would have kind of gotten pushed out of the way, so they don't really have to do much wrestling with this structure. But it's a really interesting piece of tissue that I'm just going to fold back for now. And we meet the small intestine. And again, the small intestine would also be kind of out of the way 
because you see the uterus would have pushed them to the side and they would also have slipped behind the uterus in most cases. So as I pull the small intestine out of the way, we can see the uterus. And that's what this is right here. And obviously it's smaller. I mean, she was in her mid 90s, so we can't expect her to have a uterus the size of a full term pregnancy. But this is also pretty cool. We can also see an ovary right here on the side as it connects to the uterine tube. But this uterus, just picture it as they would open this up. They're going to cut through the peritoneum and they would just see the uterus just jutting out like this. So what they would do, and again, it depends on the procedure, they'll make a cut. Typically, the incision is going to be transverse again, and it's going to then just be in the rough position of where the infant's head is. So they can then birth the infant as well as the placenta. They have to get the placenta and amniotic sac and everything else out, not just the infant. But as they birth that, they would then stitch that uterus closed. And sometimes, some procedures, they even pull the uterus out. And so as they stitch it, they have to come up, put it back in and rotate it and put it into this cavity that you're seeing right here. But again, it would be much, much bigger. And then the intestines and everything will kind of just fall in around it. I mean, obviously the uterus is going to be smaller now that it doesn't have an infant inside of it, but it's still going to be pretty big. But they don't really do much putting of the tissues back because they really only have a small window. The body will take care of most of that by itself. But what they will do, depending on, again, this depends on the technique. Sometimes they actually will, if I put this back, some techniques will stitch and suture the peritoneum close, others won't. Some techniques will actually stitch the subcutaneous fat together and others won't. It really depends. But what they have to do is suture the linea alba back together so there isn't this gap between the two sides of the rectus abdominis, which restores abdominal wall strength and prevents hernias. And then they will suture the skin back together and at that point, the C-section is complete. But one last thing I wanna do is give you a different view or perspective of how incredible pregnancy is. Here is half of a uterus on this sagittal dissection. And here is a fetus that we've had in the lab that is about 30 weeks along. So still not even to full term size yet. And it's amazing that the uterus can adapt to fit us inside. The uterus will grow up to the point where it gets close to the xiphoid process of the sternum with an average full-term fundal height of 36 to 40 centimeters. So clearly reproduction is quite the incredible process. And so I hope this helped you learn some new and useful information about C-sections. Thanks for watching everyone, and we'll see you in the next video.